Good day and welcome to this week's edition of Tourismus Namibia, where once again we talk a bit about topics that move Namibia uh, or moved Namibia over the past week, as well as taking a look at uh, two destinations once more and uh, under to the point we also have an interesting item this week. So first up under topics we will be talking about the Reader's Choice Awards 2022. Um, Yolanda Nell has stumbled across the fact that it's almost closing time to vote for these people. Uh, while then, after that, we will also have a look at World Giraffe Day. Um, so it was in this week on the 21st. And uh, there you can see we've got quite an interesting contribution from the um, WGC. So uh, we'll see that later on. And then uh, after that, we'll have a quick look at ERA and what they are up to. That's the Elephant Human Relation Aid Organization. Right, and then under destinations, we'll have a look at uh, Bell House, Atelier and Galerie, uh, which is a relatively new gallery in, in Vintuxtel. So let's have a look there. And after that, we'll visit the SOS restaurant that's up in the north in Noshakati for those of you who are spending time up in the north uh, in the near future. And under to the point, we'll have a bit of a look at uh, what happened uh, last weekend. I spent time up in the north, I drove up to Rundu, and uh, it was quite interesting to see that uh, Mr. Matthews Vakudumu had a few interesting words to say that I would like to share with you. Yes, and that's our show for this week then. So uh, first up, we have topics. Yeah, before I carry on, I, I think I forgot to actually introduce myself. Uh, my name is Frank Steffen. I'm the editor of Allgemeine Zeitung and as always responsible for Tourismus Namibia, which is the show and any other uh, items that have concerned Tourismus Namibia really. At this stage we don't bring out uh, our magazines anymore. We um, concentrate on doing it online more and more. And uh, later in the year when we've got the Namibia Tourism Expo in November, um, then we will also bring a special edition in print version again. Right, um, so up next, like I said, was topics and uh, we would like to uh, just look at the Reader's Choice Awards 2022. And um, if you visited any of the uh, 61 hotels and resorts in Namibia that have been nominated so far, then you better get voting because the Condé Nast uh, Traveller Choice Awards survey is closing soon. And Yolanda Nell actually had a look at that uh, item and spoke, uh, um, actually just compiled and looked at the whole thing. So have a look at the video. The Condé Nast Traveller 2022 Reader's Choice Award Survey is currently underway. And if you still want to cast your vote, then hurry up because this survey closes on the 30th of June. For the past 25 years, casting your vote for your favourite hotel, island, city, spa, villa or tour operator was important. This year, after two of the most challenging years for the travel industry in living memory, your vote counts even more. Showing your personal support for the hotel you have the most special memories of, or the city you've had the happiest holiday in your life in, is a powerful way to show your appreciation and excitement for the places you love to travel in the most. The Reader's Choice Awards are the most important award in the travel industry, celebrating the ultimate places, movers and fixes on the planet. 61 hotels and resorts in Namibia is part of the 2022 RCA survey. This includes the Habitats Namibia that is situated in Vintuk, Wilderness Safaris, Sources Flay Lodge, Avani Vintuk Hotel and Casino and... A lot more. If you visited any of these places in the last year, then simply go to cntraveler.com, register your account and get voting. The survey was formerly known as the Reader's Travel Awards and they have been running in the UK since 1998. Nominations are marked on various criteria including service, food and atmosphere. So one day I still want to start understanding myself why I always bring you videos with nice food and wine. 
because uh, when you sit here, you suddenly get a real urge to have something of that to eat for yourself. Anyway, those were the Reader's Choice Awards. So if you, that's why we brought you that page in the beginning. Just look for Condé Nast Traveler Choice Awards and uh, you should be able to give your vote there because they've got different categories for hotels, for um, a traveler uh, choices, uh, vehicle rentals, whatever. So just have a look at it. Right, and then uh, this week uh, we obviously had the World Giraffe Day and it's always observed on the 21st of June. And if you think about it, it's the longest day of the year for the animal with the longest neck. So quite funny that one. Um, we thought it was quite nice to have a look at her. This facial expression is just out of this world. Uh, so the giraffe population in the world decreased by around 40% over the last decade. So currently there are fewer giraffes in the wild than African elephants. And it makes you think. All in all, less than 80,000 uh, giraffes are remaining in the world. So what I did is I made contact with the Giraffe Conservation F Foundation and they provided me with this video. Giraffe have gone extinct in at least seven African countries. In the last 300 years, we've lost 90% of all giraffe habitat. Human population growth across Africa is having a massive impact on giraffe and other wildlife. We need to do something and we need to do it now. West African giraffe are rarer than mountain gorillas or even black rhino. Giraffe Conservation Foundation is the only organization that concentrates solely on the conservation and management of giraffe in the wild throughout Africa. GCF is the tip of the iceberg. Giraffe conservation happens with our partnerships. We amplify our successes by partnering with some of the world's leading institutions. In order for conservation to be real, success needs to be measurable. We are now working across 15 African countries and more than 45 million acres of giraffe habitat. We catch giraffe for two specific reasons. For translocations to areas where there's either too few or none at all. Or we catch them for collaring or tagging to fit them with satellite tracking units to find out more about their movements. At GCF, every step we take for conservation is based on solid science. So after all the planning and all the science, once that dart hits a giraffe, things kick into action. While we have a giraffe down, we want to learn as much as possible. The more we know about giraffe, the more effective we can be in helping to conserve them. We measure them, we take tail hairs, we take biopsy samples, we take blood samples. We collect all this information to inform science to make better conservation decisions. So we always get asked, how do you translocate giraffe? Well, you've got to start with science. We've got to figure out how many there are. We've got to figure out where they've got to go and make sure everything in between works. We work with amazing conservation veterinarians and scientists to put translocation plans together. When you see giraffe run off a truck and putting their first footprints into a landscape where they have gone extinct sometimes decades ago, and you turn around and look into the faces of the people who have been involved, then you know you're doing conservation. Giraffe can only be saved in Africa by African people. So we have to involve the local communities, the rangers, the people who live with giraffe and the people who look after giraffe. 
We make people proud of their giraffe and we really make a difference. Most African children have never seen a live giraffe. In Namibia this year alone, we have taken over two and a half thousand children into the field for a day and have shown them giraffe. Giraffe Conservation Foundation is a small organization with a big impact. Only 10% of giraffe traditional habitat remains today. We need to act, and we need to act now. We are Giraffe Conservation Foundation, and we are an effective team. Yeah, it's, it's quite interesting, of, you know, what people are prepared to do to, to make us all benefit at the end of the day. And the good news really at the end of the day also is that in Namibia, giraffes are actually quite numerous. I think we in fact have one of the biggest giraffe populations of the world. If I remember correctly, it's actually the biggest one. And, uh, but that, that shouldn't cause us to be sort of at ease. It's something that we have to look after all the time. Anyway, so those were the World Giraffes, uh, or was the World Giraffe Day, um, like I said, on the 21st, so it's been passed already. Um, and then we also had a look at ERA. ERA obviously stands for Elephant Human Relation Aids. It's a conservation organization, uh, pretty much busy up in the northwest of, of Namibia. And they've op offered conflict mitigation and elephant training to the community of Otaveva village, village in addition to building a protective wall. So this training aims to overcome negative perceptions of, the, of these giants and uh, obviously equip them with the knowledge to deal with conflict without further aggravating the situation with those uh, desert adapted el um, elephants especially. So our training encourages people to think critically about the complexities of human elephant conflict, Ira said on a, a social media post. Um, the organization goes on to say there, of course there is no quick fix, but being armed with knowledge on how to manage or mitigate conflict gives people the security and confidence they need to live peacefully with elephants. So that is ERA, um, those photos we got from the uh, social media pages. Um, they're always busy, just like Delra, the desert adapted line, human relation aids. All these guys are really busy trying to, to look after these animals on our, our behalf so that we hopefully one day our children's children will still be able to enjoy them. Right, and those were our topics for this week. Up next, we've got destinations. Right, um, on the destinations this week, we focus on something different altogether. Um, something that has come up over the past few, I would say almost the past year, is the fact that uh, arts and culture is being celebrated much more in Namibia, more so than it has been for a very long time. So one of the items that we brought in the Allgemeine Zeitung, I know for sure, is uh, the Bellhaus Atelier and Galerie, which is obviously a German expression, but at the end of the, the day it's a gallery. And uh, so Yandi Duplessy of uh, our paper Republicaine, she actually came up um, and, and suggested that we should look at it. And it's found um, relatively close to center of town as you go towards the show, uh, show grounds, which you see on the bottom there. It's, uh, it's in the industrial area, but on the fringes of it and uh, it's lying on the corner of Lazaret Street and uh, Bell Street. That's why it probably got its name, because the Bell House is an uh, older 
um, well looked after building in, in Bell Street. Anyway, and uh, so the vision for Bell House Atelier and Gallery as a working gallery, as they call it, was to create a milieu where uh, artists and creative individuals from all disciplines can interact and work together to showcase art, design, creativity, and general wellness in innovative ways. So more than just the stage for exhibitions, the Bell House wants to be an inviting home where artists, art lovers, and everybody with a need for beauty can visit to restore their souls and senses and harness the therapeutic uh, value of art and creative energy. So I've been there, so um, I know that uh, I enjoyed it. And I especially enjoy it because there are more than just one or two coming up. It's something that really starts going well in Namibia. And um, so Yandi organized this a little video with interviews and so on. Have a look. Welcome to the Bell House. We're happy to share our home of art uh, with you today. Sitting next to me is my partner, Marcy Maxson, and uh, we are the co-founders of Bell House. Yes, welcome here in the Brunnerkrantz village of Namibia. It's very nice to share some of our history and future with you. Um, we opened our doors on the 8th of March, 2022, and we've had um, three exhibitions. Last night we had our first Art Supper Club, um, which is an intimate dinner. Um, we invited 18 guests. Um, we had our, um, our artist, Kosman Kateri, and it was a beautiful four-course dinner um, here at the house. And it was absolutely a um, beautiful setting. And this old building that we're sitting in um, has been Ventuk since 1908, I think, right? So it's a really old, old complex. It used to be a hotel, and um, it really lends itself to to becoming a Ventuk's creative hub. And um, the the way we found this beautiful setting was that Marcy and I were looking for a very um, short term space for to take them have an exhibition and um, we walked into this space and basically just looked at each other and knew we had to do more with it it has such a great potential to do uh, much much more and um, we were lucky that our landlord is really um, interested in restoring um, the old and keeping it uh, for the future generations yeah, he's, um, he actually grew up in this house before it was a hotel, but then it became the Dina residence, and his father was a painter, and this was his atelier. So it's already had a very resonated, you know, art. So he, yeah, that was sort of the history of the, of the Bell House. Also, it's in Bell Street in um, Ventuk, um, which is sort of use its name and uh, we're also very much inspired by the Bauhaus movement and Bauhaus and Bauhaus sort of dance dance that was where the name came from. Yes and the, the name is also you know part of the name is house and it just stands for the home of art and because um, Mr. Dino was, a, was also an artist so it, and it was a home it just made sense to feel a warm and um, to resonate with this welcoming and feeling comfortable in this space. So it's not a white cube, it's warm and it's, um, the artists that we show here are lo mostly uh, local Namibian artists, um, but uh, it's also you know open to, to international artists if they want to exhibit here. At the moment we've got an artist from Zimbabwe here who's doing these beautiful sculptures that are behind us and um, the future holds so many things for Bauhaus. We, we're going into collaborations, um, we're going into really being um, a creative platform in the sense of we want to be able to give creatives the opportunity to, to express what they're doing, so be it writing books, be it poetry, be it fine art, um, even, even creativity and cooking um, is also a part of, 
of um, what is created. Um, so we really want to be a location where people can show their creative um, production, if you like, mm-hmm. outburst, not outburst, but sort of uh, expression. Yeah, also interesting, the Bauhaus movement, the fundamentals was, was based in, in craftsmanship and craft. And um, we are very much inspired in, in our fundamentals lies in, um, in craft. We, we're passionate to, to um, build and, um, and go back to the, to, you know, we, we want to make sure that craft um, lives on and we want to very much um, support craft and um, like for instance our next collaboration that is opening on the 23rd next Thursday um, is with Karakulia in um, Swakopmund um, we um, collaborated with the Karakulia Weavery and um, took forward with the artists and um, created love and basically it was a, a fusion with contemporary art very old traditional craft and weavery. Um, so the fundamentals of the Bauhaus we we, um, we implement it on a daily basis in our basically our manifesto. So um, we we invite people in their thinking to and in our thinking to implement that and that's what we do here at the Bauhaus. Um, so in a, in, a, in a greater scheme, um, we also implement that in other programs like the drawing sessions and even in our apothecary. Um, we, in many ways, we go back to the basics um, in the simple things. We don't necessarily um, want to, not that technology is, is really against it, but um, you know, we want to make people stop and think. You know, and, and how we, yeah, and that's how we sort of want to do things. So, other things that we we have and that we want to implement is we want to um, what we're very passionate about is um, the future thinkers and the future artists are the kids, and um, we want to maybe or well, maybe we want to open a, an art school. That's something that we look forward to in the future. We want to um, continue with the arts and clubs. We want to, in the summer, we want to do this um, an open door cinema um, outside of the courtyard. Um, what else do we want to do? We want to also uh, look at music in that sense, maybe have uh, summer concerts outside in the, in the courtyard. Um, and there's quite, the Brunnerkranz has a history of theatre as well. So maybe we can explore that avenue. So you can see we, we're really trying to um, look at all the different creative and avenues that are available. Um, photography, anything and everything that uh, an artist wants to create and, and show to the world, more or less. And um, something to look forward to in August, we have Heidi Lowe that's exhibiting. And then in October, November, we have a big group show to end off um, to end the year off. Um, and yeah, that's what the future holds. And we will continue with our art sub clubs for every um, exhibition we have an art sub club. And for the summer, yeah, we will have um, art cinema and we will have family cinema outdoor. So yeah, in a nutshell, that's what the balance is about. And our website is www.bauhaus.org there you can find out more about us and we have an Instagram handle as well as Facebook so you can also follow us and love us there and one more thing if you want to exhibit here and you want to share your work with us please reach out we are always open for any kind of um, you know new new art or new um, any yeah, whether it's sculpture or collage all collaborations.
Right, and that was the Bell House Atelier and Gallery. Um, and up next, we have a look at the SOS restaurant, which is found in Oshakati. And Tuyaimo Iyawa Haidula, my colleague from up in the north, she actually went there. So if we have a look at the maps, you will see there that the uh, uh, SOS restaurant actually is not far from the main road that leads up from Ondangwa to Oshakati, actually past there and eventually goes right up to Ruakana. Um, quite close, so SOS restaurant you find in Leo Shopala Street and um, so Indeleni Kaishungu, a bartender at SOS restaurant, well known also as SOS Club at Oshakati in Oshana, uh, takes us through some of the services they offer to their clients. Um, the establishment has a swimming pool which opens every day of the week for adults to swim at a fee of $100 uh, per day. The restaurant op uh, opens from 9 o'clock and closes at 22.30 and in the current chilly weather it actually provides throws for its clients so that they can have a wonderful dining experience. So well done to SOS uh, restaurant there and uh, I've, uh, you know me by now, those who regularly watch the show, I'm pretty much in favor of uh, uh, promoting these sort of things up in the north because I still feel that the central north um, right up to the border to Angola is, is a tourism destination that has not fully lived up to its potential yet in terms of um, what can be offered. So I'm always delighted to see that Tuyaimo or Tuno Ole Ngoba uh, that they show us more of the places that are available up in the north these days. Right, and uh, let's have a look at the video which they compiled for us. My name is Indileni Kaishumu. I work here as a bar lady. So welcome to Source Club, but normally they call it Source Restaurant. So uh, here is the bar. We can go in the bar. This is our bar. We have kind of one. This is our coffee machine. So if you want a coffee, it doesn't matter which time. It doesn't matter which time you want a coffee, so you can always have your coffee. Our conference hall. So, if you have an event, 
you can always come here, you go for it, then you can have a good time here. This one accommodates uh, it to range from 50, 50 people to 60 people there around. It's an open space. Just an open space. Club swimming pool. This is where customers sit. They can sit here, there, or they can also sit here if it's full. We can also put some chairs here. So this is the swimming pool. Actually, the swimming pool is hundred dollar to swim per person, but uh, only adults and the kids can only swim if they and if they are under the supervision of their parents. So you can come and swim anytime. We have a pump here, so this water actually, it used to be hot. So when you swim here, we switch on the pump, and then, you know, the water will be like as if it's massaging you. So you will just like enjoy to come and swim here. You can come swim any day, any time. This is a restaurant area. Customers can come here, sit, and eat. So we are now in the winter time. So whereby we used to give customers throw. So if you are feeling cold and then you come here, we always give you this throw to make you feel warm. So, so we have also this lamp. Actually, we used to place it on the table for the customer. It's, it chases away the mosquitoes and the flies. Mm -hmm. So whenever you come to such a restaurant, mm -hmm. you will not be disturbed by the flies and the mosquitoes. Actually, we are having something to protect you. That's our menu here. So in the menu, we have the status. So I'm just going to make some of the few things that we used to offer. This is theta. So uh, we say, caramel ring and it's by customer's choice to choose what they want to eat caramel ring. We have also the garlic snail and we have the chicken livers. Yes, some of the few things that I can mention is the standard. And then the main causes. The main causes it depends on the customer what they want to eat. So we give them a menu they choose the main course what they want to eat. So uh, let's talk about the pizzas. We also offer pizzas. Uh, the very important pizza is Mexican, but we also have the restaurant's name pizza, which is so Club Pizza. So our pizzas, they are all the best. So, and then we have, we have also the breakfast. We also offer breakfast. So the customer chooses which breakfast they want. And we also have the dessert. There's a dessert also the customer chooses what they want. We give them the menu, they go through the menu, they can they, they can choose the, the, the what the dessert which they want. But normally we are having a very nice cake which is red velvet caramel and carrot cake so if you want a very nice dessert you can always come to this restaurant and have those cakes the restaurant opens at nine o'clock in the morning and it closes at 10 30 in the evening but uh, actually during the weekends, so you know, during the weekend something is very busy and we also like want to push the cell, we can go up to 11 o'clock if we are late, but normally the actual time is 10.30.
Yeah, I almost forgot to, to insert the video for you there. Um, but then, like I said, SOS Restaurant, so next time you go there, it's, a, it's in a very nice area, so um, no problems there either. Anyway, um, those were our destinations for today already. Up next, we've got to the point. Right, so um, last week, um, on the, the week before this past week, um, I actually made a point of driving up to Rundu. Now, if you have a look here, um, you can see how we took that route. I actually made use of the program uh, Relive, um, where they basically show you going all the way from Windhoek right up to Rundu. Um, as you can see there, this was at Okahantia. I inserted a photo just to show you <laughs> that we were essentially there, going up to Ochiwarongo and, you know, um, uh, like I said, it's quite a long route there. You see the Omataku Mountains, um, quite an interesting route, a nice route to actually drive, especially after the good rain seasons we had. Um, it, you really have quite a lot of uh, uh, good pasture left at the time of year when normally the farmers are very worried already. So drove up to Otavi and then obviously had to turn right and uh, go from there onwards on to, to um, this was at Otavi when I quickly stopped there for a break and then we won went on to Grootfontein and uh, you know obviously past combat to Grootfontein and finally up to Rundu. Um, and the reason was that um, the farmers unions had called for a meeting with Recon Africa and Recon Africa had eventually agreed that they should have that public meeting. To my biggest surprise when I came there I don't know who was more surprised, was it Nami or was it uh, the people of Recon Africa? They really did not want me there. Uh, you, you could continuously hear, what is he doing here? Why is he here? He should not be here. He wasn't invited, arguing with me that it wasn't a, a, a public meeting. Uh, it ended up with me uh, uh, telling them it actually is a public meeting. Uh, a bit of haji baji where my cell phone was ripped out of my hands and I had to recover it and so Quite a lot of nonsense. I stayed over here at Takusemba uh, Lodge. Those are the photos that I made there. And this was obviously my delight to have actually reached that place. That was the nice part of the trip. But the bad part was the next morning when we had to, to look at, uh, at, at Recon Africa really denying us the right that should be allowed to all journalists uh, to attend such public meetings. Because the moment that um, you talk about EIAs and you talk about discussing EIAs, uh, environmental impact assessments. That is something that we should be entitled to be at. And uh, I was eventually told to get out or either be locked up uh, by the, otherwise be locked up by the police. Um, I had people in there that obviously had contact with me, gave me photos, showed me what was on the agenda, so I could sort of follow from the outside. But eventually, um, I had to give up um, after I spoke to one of her. Uh, he's, he's quite uh, high up in the, in the um, government circles. And he said to me, look, this was supposed to be a public meeting because we as farmers actually called the meeting. So it ended up with me being called back. Um, so, um, so we were able to cover that event. And, and, and the, what we've been saying on this show in, the, in our reports all the time is that the originally environmental impact assessment was not properly done by risk-based solutions who's the environmentalist who, 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 who did that study for Recon Africa. And we can be angry f at Recon Africa all we want. At the end of the day, um, they are a business. They want to, to search for oil or, and gas and they do what they do. I'm much more agitated about the fact that our government simply does not live up to its responsibility. We should have had public meetings and gatherings. Now, from the very first time I went up there in March 2021, spoke to the people, it quickly transpired that most of them had, uh, had no idea what Recon Africa was all about, what gas and oil exploration was all about, what, uh, um, what, what, what was proven over and over by geologists that understand this sort of thing 
is simply that uh, without fracking you will not be able to recover oil uh, and gas in that area simply because of the uh, geological uh, surface that you're looking at. Um, but more than that, um, they, they drilled for water and subsequently got their permission to do so. They occupied land and had not spoken to the land council, neither had they spoken to the farmers. So this whole thing has been a shambles all along. Now, at the end of the day, if we were as Namibians prepared to have the allowance uh, for, for or the, the ECC, the environmental uh, certificate, withdrawn for something like uh, uh, other mines that don't live up to expectations, then the same should apply to Recon Africa for a very long time. But because government is somehow, with its 10% that they have as a shareholding, which has now been reduced to 5%, as we know, somehow they are so engaged in that process that no matter what happens out there, they don't care. And I, as a journalist, have often been uh, accused that I've been lying about what's happening there when I say people are not properly informed, they do not realize what happens, they, uh, they, they, uh, Recon Africa does not respect their rights to their land, it does not respect the fact that even on the internet site of the Mi uh, Ministry of Mines and Energy, there is a standard form that uh, any farmer should be offered, where Recon Africa should offer them uh, payment for use of their land, use of their wood, use of water, um, all types of things. So this is not only about going onto a land after you've got an approved EIA. You still need to negotiate with a farmer and tell him, listen, this is where I want to be. So anyway, so I've been listening to people telling me I'm talking nonsense. But if we look at this ma one map here, you, you will see the Karoo Rift is, is what has always been uh, the big I issue. But you can see the rift is the darker areas. That's the basic Karoo basins. And then uh, further up, you see the Karoo subcrops. So this week, Recon uh, Africa and AMCO brought out a, a statement where they said, we've successfully completed the second seismic acquisition program. Nobody knows where that EIA for the second seismic acquisition program is. But anyway, so they've covered 761 kilometers of 2D seismic completed, as they said, on budget and on schedule. Uh, on budget is quite funny because the other day they actually reported that they've gone way over budget in all their endeavors. Anyway, so, and, and they said, uh, uh, um, 180,000 human hours were utilized during the campaign, of which approximately 80% were Namibians recruited nationally and predominantly from local communities. This is not what we heard at the meeting at uh, Rundu last week, where farmers said, what is this with you keeping people busy for 14 days and then the work, uh, uh, the, 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 the employment opportunities that you promised that have never realized. And they were taking to task on a, on a, on a big scale there. So to talk here of 80% were Namibians recruited to do what, for how long? And there, there is no, no respect for, uh, for labor law there, that's for sure. And so what they've been saying is, including phase one, Recon Africa has currently acquired 1,211 kilometers of seismic within its over 34,000 square kilometer licensed area. Now you must imagine, they've covered 1,211 kilometers and the EIA that they've given out would have been 450 kilometers, of which 95% would have been along existing roads. Now, if, if you look at the newest maps that they've given out, they've crisscrossed that whole area second to none. So nothing about existing ways. And this was one of the items that the farmers uh, got uptight about uh, at the meeting in Rundu, where they literally said, but you've been crossing our farms forever, and now you come and ask us for permission again. Uh, because apparently these seismic uh, exercises, contrary to what they've been saying, have not revealed that much. So now they want to go into the next exercise, asking the farmers for permission. And so far, the farmers have withheld that permission. Because they say, you've been damaging our property, you've not been paying us uh, um, when you damage it, you've not repaired the damage. And there were a couple of heated arguments on, on, on Saturday. It went till almost 2 o'clock. Oh, yeah, it went towards three o'clock almost. Um, so it was a long meeting. And the big thing was at one stage during the discussions, um, Mr. Matthews uh, Vakudumu, who's the brother of the regional governor, and I'll, I must say the regional governor has been in support of this oil pro project all along, 
and he's been known to be so. He's uh, Mr. Bonifacio's uh, Wakodumo. But his brother Matthew's got up and he suddenly just demanded to know, who do you think you are? This is not right. Call this uh, uh, um, meeting to order. You have clearly not informed our traditional leaders properly because they don't know what you're talking of because the people indicated we still do not know. We're still not informed properly. You've lost uh, the around, told us you would talk to us. And it simply doesn't come to that point where people are properly informed, where media is present and they can repeat what has been said, where information has been shared so that we can pass it out by publishing it in the papers. It does not happen. And so these guys were getting very angry and he excused himself from the meeting saying this meeting is not, uh, should be called to order and postponed until traditional leaders are properly informed. Now have a look at the video that we brought along uh, which we took when we spoke to him afterwards quickly outside the auditorium of the Kavango Regional Council. Yes, you stumped out of the recon in the Farmers Union meeting. Can you tell us why you did that? I am a farmer born here yes. and I am a businessman. I only heard about Recon since their inception here. But I was loved eh, to hear from the beginning the involvement of our chieftains. Mm. Eh? But to my surprise, when it comes today, listening to their introduction and the discussion which they presented, eh, so after all the, the, uh, the, the present, uh, presentation, uh, one of the uh, Birikus mm. uh, headmen, mm. senior headmen, mm. come up and questioning uh, the, the security. security. Yeah, no, I was there when yeah. he spoke, yes. He questioned, mm. saying that no, this kind of a meeting mm. supposed to take a day before or uh, some time ago mm. since they arrived here, mm. but he don't, do not understand. Why should they continue with this such meeting? Mm. So to me, mm. we, are, are, we, uh, our, pos our possessing with the land mm. is according to the chieftain mm. who accorded us mm. the uh, letter. Mm. Mm. And this letter mm. gave us the power mm. to acquire this land mm. legally mm. so that we can process our uh, final uh, application through the Ministry of Land. Yes. Now, if the homepass, the chiefs, mm. the fumus are left behind, mm. what do you think? Who are you mm. eh, to come just to talk to the people mm. on behalf of who? If now the chief themselves are questioning mm. a such a uh, well-known recon Africa mm. eh, up to the last minute mm. to have this uh, such a meeting, mm. now uh, a question arises. Where, are, uh, where there are mixed feelings, mm. some do want to listen, some do want to support. Like me, I tell them, uh, in the absence mm. of our chiefs mm. or of our customs, right, mm. I have to walk out. This is unprecedented. Uh, pre uh, 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 unprecedented. Okay, so what do you think should happen? What must happen, first and foremost, they have to go down, mm. not only to consult the poor community mm. in various inland. They have to go and have a thoroughly meeting eh, with our leaders, more especially the FUMU, the chief, the HOMPA, mm. before they go to take up any activity in this, uh, in, in this country. So mm. this is just like a, family, a, a mafia a business, whereby you eh, the, the, totally do, do, do not the, uh, honor the people or the leader of that uh, Santana uh, region or that particular uh, tribe. Okay. Yeah. You are, you are mostly focusing on consultation to the Hompas, but what is your feel about the oil discovery underground? How, what is your feel about that? Look here, oil discovery. Mm. Eh? No Canadian, mm. no uh, Western country has been here. Mm. None of them, mm. none even the, the Russia or uh, uh, French who have... Eh, the know-how of the new technology, mm. eh? all the presentation which they done here, based on what they have found, I don't have uh, a clue on it. I'm just a listener. Uh, the, so the, you, you don't have. So they haven't. You haven't seen any evidence to show this oil underground. They haven't seen anything. I never seen it. That mm. is only the geographic and all that uh, 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 map map which they showed us. Mm. But uh, in details, I don't have any clue. Only for those people who really have 
uh, the understanding on that line or on that level. Not everybody will understand what it is all about. No. In terms of trust, so you don't trust? Uh, no, I don't trust at all. Okay. I don't trust them at all because we look here at, 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 at the coast. Mm. They wanted to mine this, uh, what you call it? Phosphate. Phosphate. Yes. So when the public stood up, mm. they stopped. Yes. They need a thorough investigation mm. and also to do a proper EIA. Yes. Yes. Not that, uh, no, we done uh, this EIA. Who is the, the specialist involved? Who did this? The environment of Namibia. Don't compare environment of Namibia to Canada or to Europe. No. Mm. This is totally a different area. Okay. And uh, let them take people to go to Kabinda or wherever they mm. refer to. Okay. Eh? Mr. Uh, Mr. Agudumo, government, Namcor, everybody has assured us they won't damage the, the, the underground, everything. Everything is going according to plan and it's in order as by law. What is, what, now, what is your advice to government? Look here, our government is very young. Mm. You can even look at it today. Mm. Where are they positioned? Eh? Mm. In terms of education, yes. in terms of uh, finance, mm. eh? even our budget. Eh? Look at eh? how bad it looks like. Eh? Everything is just going down. Yes. Now you want to tell me they are now experts on this line? No, okay. they are not. Let we have an expert who will drive eh, ahead or will be on the front line to let us know exactly what will happen. Now, if damage are done, who will uh, pay this damage? Okay. If the government is the, uh, the, 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 the owner of this project, okay. who will uh, pay this damage? Okay. No, let them not uh, play us a, 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 a game of, uh, of uh, 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 African, uh, will remain African. No, mm. this time around we, we have to decide for ourselves, okay. like the Chinese did. Yes. Chinese did and they succeed. Mm. Eh? Russia did, they succeed. Why not us? Okay. Come on, Africa. Wake up! Thank you very much, Mr. Vakudumu, for your time. You are welcome. Okay. Right, and that was Mr. Matthews Vakudumu. So whoever is still running around there, especially Recon Africa, uh, telling media that we are spreading lies and, and, and that we are making our stories up as we go, I think at the latest now you will see that that is not true. Um, there is definitely... Uh, I'm not saying that all Kavango people are against gas and oil. What I'm saying, there is a substantial portion, I would judge it at least to be half, if not more, because especially the uh, rural people are totally set against it by now, whereas the urban people, um, when I spoke to people on the street in Rundu, some were ignorant, some uh, didn't care, um, some didn't understand it. But, but generally you find that there is no proper information sharing. And the second part is that I would say the population that I spoke to are split about 50-50 whether they're for it or against it. Where I must say that the 50% for it has a good portion of it uh, where they say I don't really care as, as long as it brings money. But it is not based on, on proper argument and understanding whether there is a risk in, involved or not. So that's Recon Africa for you. Um, I thought that was very interesting that the brother of the regional governor actually got up and said enough is enough. There, there needs to be a proper way in which we uh, approach this whole subject. So anyway, that's a very interesting part and I hope you enjoyed my show because we're now at the end of it. Um, hopefully we'll be able to entertain you next week at the same time, same place. Until then, remain healthy and look after yourself. Bye. Mm -hmm.